I did test this on a cadaver actually. If you put a cannula into a vessel and try and move it, it feels quite tethered. Whether when you're in the fat, which is where most cannulas are, should move quite easily. So that's one of your guides. Welcome to the Aesthetics Mastery Show. I'm Dr. Tim Pierce. Hi, I'm Randa Pierce. And today we're talking about five dangerous places to inject that aren't deep because we did that last week if you didn't catch it. So this week we're talking about the more superficial places that you need to be very careful when injecting. So what is it about these areas that sort of sets them apart? So the thing that sets these apart is for aesthetic reasons, your needle is often parallel with the blood vessel and they are where the blood vessels are relatively it's sort of in the subcutaneous fat quite often, uh, which makes them a little bit more vulnerable. Not always. I'd say the biggest factor is that your needle is often parallel to the place that you're injecting. And that means if a needle is parallel, obviously the chance of cannulating that vessel is much higher because you've just got vastly more um, ability to get all the way into the vessel, which means when you inject, all of your product flows into that area and you cause a much bigger occlusion. So areas where you're parallel to arteries, you need to be very careful and aware of that risk. So which is the first one? Top of the list has to be most common place to cause an occlusion, probably due to the frequency of procedures, which is lip augmentation. So if you're injecting lips, you will probably get an occlusion at some point. They're highly vascular and that doesn't that makes them less safe. Uh, but yeah, you need to be aware of your injections. So superior and inferior labial arteries both run parallel with the lips. Many injection techniques teach you to inject in a way that's parallel with the vermilion border, which means you're constantly putting your needle repeatedly parallel with the artery and the chances of getting, at least on one of your injections, a little bit of the needle in that place and then blocking it is much, much higher. What kind of injection techniques? So the classic, you know, vermilion border, uh, filtrum injections, Anywhere where you're, where you're running the needle along the, the vermilion border, you're likely to be close to that artery. So it's probably the most common way to augment lips is to inject that way. Um, so one of the, the pros of the, some of the tenting or Russian lip techniques where you're running at 90 degrees, at least you're not parallel with the vessel. And although many will say that bruising is much worse, um, you're less likely to actually fill a blood vessel with dermal filler. So that's the kind of thing you might do to make it a little bit safer. Uh, you might choose a different technique, um, inject smaller amounts at a time. Uh, being aware of your depth is really critical. So uh, I've had one occlusion in 12 years now, so my rates are really good. And that's primarily due to getting the depth correct. So not injecting too deep, knowing that the artery tends to run just beneath the, uh, the muscle in most people, unfortunately not in everyone, but you're, you've got that depth to protect you. I know that new injectors, often you can tell their resolution is not that high, so that it looks to the untrained eye that there is a similar depth, but someone who's been injecting for five, 10 years will know immediately that's a bit too deep. So we need to be careful of depth in particular when injecting lips. Is there any way that we can get that resolution better so we understand that we're at the wrong depth? Well, you really want to be a super, well, with a good quality product, this is the caveat, because you can't, if you're using a very thick and stodgy product, you can't really be that superficial. You're often hiding relatively poor products underneath the tissue. But if you're using a good quality product, you can be very, very superficial on the lips because a good soft product will blend in really well. So you want to be doing a little depth check just to make sure when you lift that needle up, you should see the skin blanch along the surface. And when you rest that needle back down again with zero force across it, you should be no blanching. If you get blanching at rest when there's no force across it, you're, you're, in, you're above the papillary dermis, means you're squeezing the blood supply out of the dermis. And if you inject there, you'll be able to see the filler. So you need to be a little bit deeper than that, but then not miles deeper than that. So elevation of the lip, you should see the shape of the needle quite clearly. Um, if you're lifting the whole lip up, then you're probably a little bit too deep and you're probably a little bit close to the, to the, to the blood vessel. That's a little bit less important when you're angled down and away from the artery. But if you're parallel with the artery, that would be that would be a very dangerous place to inject. Okay, I know you're not. This isn't about products, but can you give us an example of one good quality product that would that would help us? Well, most of the products that are made for lips tend to be relatively soft and malleable because they're emulating lips. I think the danger would come if you were going off piste and using thicker products. And I've had I've had a few clients over the years request for very much thicker products that some other injector treated them with that they quite liked. Um, and that's the kind of case when you might be using a product that would be less suitable, more superficially. Um, I like Juvenum Bowlift. Um, there are lots of products in, in all of the mainstream products that you'd heard of that are suitable for using lips in that way, though. Okay. Where is our next 
dangerous area that runs parallel to an artery. Okay, so superior and inferior labial arteries we're counting as one. The next would be the dorsal nasal artery when doing rhinoplasty. So dorsal nasal artery runs along the spine of the nose. Once again, you're parallel with your instruments. So this is really, really risky area. Whether you use cannula or not, I've seen one of the worst occlusions I've ever seen has been using cannula in, uh, and it was occlusion of the dorsal nasal artery. And this is because, because you're parallel and it's a very tight space, I believe cannulas are a bit more risky because as you're trying to edge your way up, you have to put a reasonable amount of force on it. And if you pop into a blood vessel, you tend to stay. That's the problem with cannulas. You tend to stay in that position and you're trying to add volume. And when you're adding a lot in one place, the size of the occlusion gets so much worse and it's way more likely when you're parallel. So no one uses cannulas at 90 degrees to the dorsal nasal artery or very, I mean, I do actually sometimes if you're going off, off laterally, but mostly if you're doing a dorsal bump, um, you're going to be adding volume with a cannula parallel to the arteries that's particularly risky. So you might want to choose a different technique. I know this is something, um, there's a lot of debate around this. Many people think needles are more, more risky. I think needles will increase the frequency of occlusion, but decrease the severity of, of the occlusion, which makes it really hard to decide which to use. I would much rather have a superficial occlusion of some skin. We, In fact, we've had one in clinic. We had a, one of the doctors was training and it caused a superficial occlusion on the nose. They just dissolved it. Patient went home, no, no negative outcome. Very different to a really big one and very different, of course, to blindness, which is one of the side effects of injecting this artery with enough product to fill back down the supratrochlear artery and block the, um, the retinal artery. So what can we do to prevent... So um, you could use techniques that are less likely to be parallel. So even just going at 90 degrees straight in and touching the periosteum, you're, a little, you're less likely to cannulate an artery doing that than you are running parallel with it. So angle of entry will, will make you a little bit safer. The amount that you inject and the depth that you inject. Now, most of these arteries are not at the level of the periosteum. So being either deep, probably deep is the safest. So touching the periosteum with the bevel pointing down is probably a little bit safer than at the intermediate level parallel with the artery is probably the riskiest way to doing it. And of course, either side of the nose, because mostly the dorsal nasal artery, there are two of them and they run slightly either side of the midline. So being on the midline will also make you a little bit safer in that area. Small amounts at a time, blocking the supratrochlear artery when you're injecting can make it a bit safer. Um, these are all little things that I do. Using a product that you know is a little bit, uh, is able to aspirate, that you've tested, um, all these things will just chip away at the risk and make it a little bit safer. When you say blocking the artery, what do you mean? So you, you block it with your finger when you're okay. injecting. So I just put a bit of pressure and, and obviously you're not preventing an occlusion, you're just preventing an occlusion that fo flows back down the supratrochlear artery and causes blindness. You could still cause a superficial occlusion doing that. But as I said, I think they're relatively easy to handle compared with the ones that go intracranially. So which is next on the, the hideous area list? So facial artery along the nasolabial fold, because we're often injecting parallel, whether you're using cannula or needle, you tend to be parallel with the nasal with the nasolabial fold and with the artery, which runs usually just lateral to the nasolabial fold. So parallel with that with that area, and you're likely to cause an occlusion occasionally. Um, this is a bit more common apparently in Chinese faces because they tend to have the artery in the nasolabial fold more frequently. So even more more crucial to be aware of it. Um, and if you obviously block this blood vessel, it's a major problem because it's the main blood supply to the base. Okay. So what can we do to chip away at the risk? So in order to chip away at the risk here, um, depth is probably the most important thing. Um, many will advocate for a deep periosteal injection because there's quite a lot of fat in this area and mostly the artery runs in the fat. So in the nasolabial fat pad, you will have the artery in most people, which means if you're deep and you're on the periosteum, you're unlikely to be in the blood vessel. You can obviously aspirate, but that's the that's the main way using a needle to be safe. Now, the other end of the spectrum is you inject so superficially that you know you're not in the fat. That means you're in the dermis. Most people would be treating a crease this way. So if you haven't got volume loss, it's not actually a fold, it's the actual crease that you're trying to treat, then you're much more superficial with a good depth check and aspirating, you're very unlikely to be in the artery at that level. If the artery was at that level, you'd feel it really easily just by putting your hand on it, which is one more thing you might do. Um, I once, particularly when I started training clinicians and I start to actually look for these for teaching purposes, you'll find it palpable in maybe a third of your patients. You can actually feel at least some of the artery and that will help guide you where not to inject as well. Where's the next danger area? 
So the next artery that is parallel with some injections is the supratrochlear artery. So we talked about this last week because the entry point is on the periosteum. So you'd never inject deep, but we also need to be careful of it higher up because it does get more superficial as it goes up the forehead, but it's still particularly risky because most of the, art the vessels are still running parallel with the, with the needle that you might be putting in if you're treating a frown line, for example. So um, a common indication Patients often want to treat the frown line, but you are right parallel with the vessel that you might occlude. Okay. So what can we do? So similar, we need a multi-stage approach. You need to be uh, making sure that you're at the right depth. Now this vessel, it is quite superficial the, and the higher up you go from, the, from its entry point, the more superficial it gets. So you're trying to be as superficial as you can. You're trying to use small amounts of product at a time. Obviously you're aspirating. Uh, pointing the needle upwards rather than down if you can, occluding the artery with your finger while you're injecting might make it safer as well. Using products, you know, aspirate well, um, trying to keep the total volume to a minimum. All these things will just chip away at the risk. Checking pillar re re refill after every procedure, which I recommend for all areas we've treated, all of these will just make it safer and safer so that you hopefully you stack all these measures together and you're going to have very few problems treating this area. We'll link below the aspirating experiment that Tim did a while ago where Dr. Omer uh, actually, you know, injected you, didn't he? And then you did some, you aspirated with the different fillers, brands. Yeah. Then we did 12 different fillers and showed how many of them worked and how many of them don't. There were a few surprises, ones that didn't work at all. No matter how long you hold back the plunger, you never get any blood back. So it's worth checking that out. We'll link that below. So what is the fifth and final danger area for running parallel to an artery? So submental artery when treating jawlines. If you're running a needle parallel to the jawline, just usually just on, on the inferior side of the mandible is an artery, and you can often feel this one as well. So it's worth it's worth feeling for it. Um, I know I've seen an aspiration on stage. Someone, it was Roger Killer actually aspirated and, and he got a bright red aspirate. In fact, I don't think I saw it. I think he's told that story enough times that I imagined <laughs> I saw it. But I certainly heard him mention that. And that makes sense because you're parallel with the artery. We tend to be injecting quite a, uh, quite a few times along this area of using a needle. Even if you're using a cannula, you're parallel with this area. And this is an area to be particularly careful. What would go wrong if we did get that? So this would be an occlusion of the chin, probably. You'd see an occlusion uh, affecting the skin and the, the muscle around the chin. Okay. And how can we prevent it? Um, Similar to other things, you want to be gentle with the cannula. You want to be having those analog tests. So is the cannula mob mobile? Is it flowing easily or does it feel like it's tethered? I did test this on a cadaver, actually. If you put a cannula into a vessel and try and move it, it feels quite tethered. Whether when you're in the fat, which is where most cannulas are, should move quite easily. So that's one of your guides uh, is that it's an easily movable instrument if you're using a cannula. Um, you might aspirate as well because we know that works with certain products and cannulas that give you a little bit of safety. Um, a lot of mobility with the cannula I think makes it less likely that you're going to put a lot into one place because even if you were in at one point you're probably moving it in and out quite a lot. So I think moving it de decreases the risk a little bit. You could attempt where possible just not to be parallel with it too often but I, but it's quite hard along here because the shape you want to create is it's, it lends you to go parallel with the vessel. So I really hope you found that helpful. Don't forget that with this episode comes a simple download, an image of the anatomy with all of these components listed from this show, last week's show, and the show we're going to do next on the different ways that you can cause an occlusion and how to inject more safely. So make sure you down that, download that. There'll be a link in the bio. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel because next week we're going to be doing the third episode in this series of danger areas of the face. What's it about next week? So it's a theoretical cause of skin necrosis, which is capillary compression, a bit like pressure sores and where you can cause that with dermal filler in the face. Okay. See you next week. Thanks for watching.